What's going on, guys? What's up? What's up? It's Manuel Cadoy from Black Sands, and this is one of the first lectures I'm going to be doing about Hollywood in general, right? I figure that's basically my form of expertise, messaging, right, in the black community, and I feel like it's a time that I actually do some lectures and get that down. So first off, sound check. Am I sounding, am I sounding good right now? Am I clear? Let me know in the comments. If so, then I'm going to crack this bad boy up. <laughs> We're going to have a good time, too. You see how you see how I'm doing this thing? You're going to see raw like that. Every time I do a lecture, I'm going to do like a little meme shot like that with raw just holding his hands ready to go in. We're about to go in on this bad boy. <laughs> okay, so let's start this up. So what we're going to be breaking down today is slave movies. That's the topic of discussion. All right. I'm only going to be talking about slave movies and what it means to the black community. Why Hollywood seems to have an infinite amount of money for slave movies, but ain't got any money at all for stories about African civilizations. And people might say, oh, well, maybe it's about the money. Maybe they care more about money or maybe they care more about profits. But at the end of the day, I'm going to explain why that don't make no sense at all and why the reality is there's an agenda that they're trying to do. And uh, we're going to tackle that right now. So let's start this off. Now, I want to ask you a question, right? And I'm going to read these comments, too, because I want to see your comments. He said, the Hollywood agenda. To me, there's three things that are core to the Hollywood agenda when it comes to slave movies. One social conditioning you are a second class citizen black man black woman you are second class we must remind you of your origins as a second class citizen right institutionalizing who makes it out of these slave movies the people that survive are they the ones who rebelled or are they the ones that played their role until someone allowed them to get out of slavery hmm what does that teach our children? What does that teach people in general when the, the hero of the story, the guy who survives, right, basically survived by not stepping out of line? Mm -hmm. And what about emasculation, right? Why every time, you know, that we watch these films and stuff like that, all they do is show men being basically like ripped apart or torn down to the point where they're all emasculated. It seems like that seems to be a very common theme, right? They're either emasculated or demonized, one or the other, right? You can't be just a regular person when these slave movies come around. So this is my opinion, but what's yours? Let me know in the comment section right now. I'm about to look. Look at that right here. I got a comment right here. This sounds right. The complacent folks survive. Have you noticed that when you watch these films? When you watch these films, have you noticed that? That the person who's the least active, the person who's the least rebellious gets the greatest reward? What is that? What is the messaging behind that to us, right, as black Americans? That if we simply accept what's the best case scenario for us, it's going to be better for us in the long run. I don't necessarily agree with that. What do you guys think? I'm telling you guys. So let's continue this bad boy. Let's continue this. Thank you so much for saying that. That was an amazing comment. Complacent. If they complacent, they survive and they benefit in the movie. <laughs> Look at this one. They won't stop until they put a black man in a dress. Dave Chappelle said that. Dave Chappelle said, hell nah, I ain't wear no dress. I don't care if you think it's funny. But he's like, they want to put a dress on everybody. Man, we can't be having that. <laughs> Let's continue with this bad boy. So, by the numbers, right? I like sewing stuff by the numbers. People always ask me, you know, why I do certain things. 
and, and why I say certain things, they're like, oh, well, maybe maybe it's the budget. Maybe they just don't have the market for for uh, African civilization stories. Maybe this, maybe that. Well, let's look at the numbers. What do the numbers say? Uh, so 40 years, I'm going for 40 years of black cinema, all right? This is 40 years of productions about black people. And during that time period, we had 80 plus films or shows on slavery alone. That's not including civil rights. That's not including uh, gang bangers or, or stories about um, deadbeat dads, right? And single moms. That's not stories about... <laughs> It's not stories about twerking or drug dealing or anything like that. I'm specifically talking about just slavery. All right. Then we have 40 plus movies on civil rights. You know, that's how many films were funded and shows were funded by Hollywood. But in that same time period of 40 years, we only had one on African civilizations. And if we're talking about that one, it was Shaka Zulu. Shaka Zulu was one of the only major budget um, productions made ever about an African civilization doing anything positive, you know? And that's the straight up reality of the situation right now, man. Like, like that is why companies like Black Sands Entertainment exist. That is why people support us on Patreon. That's why people buy our stock. And that's why people buy the books for their kids because they, they've seen the numbers themselves. Some of you guys are 40 years old and you've never seen anything besides Shaka Zulu. You're 40 years old. You've never seen anything about African civilizations. And that's the reality is because that's what they want you to see. Uh, it wasn't a movie, but it was a Hollywood budget production. So it was like $23 million production for a TV series. So it does count. It does. They spent a lot of money making that bad boy. And it actually made a lot of money, which is why it's so funny that it didn't do anything after that. Because um, when you look at it, Basically, Black Panther made a billion dollars in sales, right? Through through ticket sales alone in the U.S., it did a billion dollars. That that alone should make 10, 20 different films about African fantasy immediately marketable because you're like, hey, look at this hot market. We should build it. So what do they do? 2022, before they ever make another Black Panther, and anything between that, nothing. Absolutely zero films about Black fantasy at all. Now, how the hell did they miss that 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 mark? The reality is they ain't miss it. It's going according to plan. They only want to make one superhero character that's Black, and that's about it. They ain't trying to make a whole bunch of them. They damn sure ain't looking for new ideas. They want to do they want to do the least amount possible to empower people. All right. Because the same thing happened with 300. 300 only made $500 million domestically. It made $500 million domestically. In the next two years, they made 12 films on ancient Greece. They made 12 of them. It's like a billion dollars of money they, they invested in Greek films because of the success of 300. They were like, oh, we have to make more. This all, all this money coming in. There's no way we can afford to miss this opportunity. Black Panther does a billion. They're like, yeah, let's just wait till Black Panther 2. <laughs> well, that's all I got to say about that. Shoot. Let's keep it moving. So these are my personal opinions. You can believe what I believe, or you might be believing in a different way. But this is what I believe about the purpose of slave movies. So what they want you to believe is that it helps us never forget our history. And it reminds white people of the wrongs of their ancestors, right? We love hearing that one, right? Hey, these are the wrongs of your ancestors. It, this is important. So they learned that, right? Um, film, the films are created in the, from the black community. That's a good one. That's one of the best tricks they got is the films are made in the black community. And that it promotes diversity. But the reality is society socially conditions black people to never step out of line that's how i think the purpose is it's not to forget about our history it's to remind us that if we step out of line the whole might of the government will come down upon us if you look at every single slave film the government is the ultimate enforcer of the rules not the actual slave owner it's the government that comes in and cracks down on people in everything in the civil rights moves movies Who's doing the cracking down? The government. 
<laughs> so it's letting you know never step out of line in society because if we have to choose between the racist and you the government's gonna choose the racist at least that's what they're trying to convince you of so you don't ever step out of line he said then you know um shows current racist the good old days don't ever think for a second that movies where basically you know white slave owners um having sex with a whole bunch of women right and beating the men and whipping them with chains and then some racist guy sees that and says man i am so ashamed they probably thinking man i missed this damn thing i can't believe that we don't have this right now this is ridiculous you really mean to tell me those people are the ones that are watching this and saying man this is this is so embarrassing i'm so embarrassed about this nah man it's probably one of their best films they probably love them damn things they can't wait for another slave movie to come out <laughs> <laughs> then they got then they heavily curate them and, and i'm gonna give you a great example of this too in a second but they heavily curate who actually makes these films so even when the filmmaker is black all right so even when the filmmaker is black there are certain kind of political views they have there are certain kind of people they live with they're people that they exist with that they that, that they're not part of our circle they might be black but they don't necessarily think that black objectives and black personalities matter you understand they just they they they, they, ain't, they ain't down like that you know <laughs> and we'll give you an example in a second and then uh it promotes slate agendas so this is more on the money side of things so what happens is if all you ever make is movies about slaves and movies about black trauma right then those are the only movies that black people see because there's no other movies right but then you say oh well black people only want to see these but reality is, is the only thing that's a, that's given to them to watch. And every time they've been given something different, whether it's a horror story about clones coming back to kill black folk, which was really dope, you know, <laughs> shout out to Jordan Peele, right? He said, or anything like that, right? Or stories about, uh, 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 um, you know, anything that's different. We show up and we buy crazy amount of tickets. And what do they do? They lock it down. They say, nah, we ain't going to keep doing this diverse storyline stuff. Let's get back to slaves real quick, as fast as possible. All right? They want the slate to stay the same. They want the scouting to stay the same. They want the next slave film, and they don't want any slave film. They want ones that match their agenda. All right? Let's go a little further than that. Here's a curation example, right? Big or long. Everybody knows Big Along. This is one of the biggest controversial controversial decisions they made in Hollywood and recently. He said, this is a great example of curation. So when we say curation, we're they're saying they're choosing who is going to represent black culture and black history, right? So the writer of the Harriet Tubman film, right, decided that out of all the historical documented white slave owners, and killers and whatever who were hunting down Harriet Tubman all her freaking life, we had to make sure that the biggest threat to Harriet Tubman in a film is a make-believe character who was a black man hunting down slaves. Because clearly we couldn't just pull out any of the characters who was historically real who were who was stopping her all her life. This is what we call agenda. Now, the reason why I say it's agenda is because Harriet Tubman is literally the most popular slave in history. All right. Everybody knows Harriet Tubman. The most redneck of redneck, redneck people know Harriet Tubman. Everybody knows Harriet Tubman. They probably get a thousand scripts a year, a thousand scripts a year about Harriet Tubman and movies and pitches and agents throwing them scripts about Harriet Tubman. And guess which one got funded? Out of all of them, the one, they said, they said, man, we got all these positions. We got all these things from Harriet Tubman. I wonder which one we're going to put our money in. Hey, what about the one where the black guy is hunting Harriet Tubman? I don't remember any of that in the books. Well, it's not about what's in the books. It's about what we need to tell the audience. Don't trust black men. Don't trust them. They'll turn on you in a dime. That was the that was the reality of the characters. Why the character was inserted into the story had no business being there. But they said, well, at one point in time in history, there were such a thing as black 
slave hunters. Yeah, at one point in time in history, there was such a thing as black kings, but it seems like y'all don't want to put films out about that. <laughs> I'm going to pause right here and I'm going to go look at these comments because I know somebody's going off right now. I know somebody is going off right now about this film. How do you feel about the fact that Harriet Tubman brought out a black man to be the big villain, the villain, all them slave masters, all them slave masters. And they said, you know what? This guy's the villain. Tell me what you guys feel about that. We got some saying it's just hot garbage, man. A lot of people didn't even see that bad buoy. It's shameful. I like that. That's a statement. It's true, though. It is shameful. That's why we do what we do, because, because we understand that there's a serious problem with production and with the curation process. The people who cut the checks right? They have their own idea of what's acceptable to black audiences. And they never think of what's inappropriate to black audiences. So, so they're like this. All right, we want to have a story about Harriet Tubman that's acceptable to black audiences, right? But then they'll be like, and we're going to make the black villain a black man that never existed in history. And they don't think, they don't be like, well, that's very offensive to black people. And that could potentially cause shifts between, I mean, rifts between black women and black men. Furthermore, because it's Harriet Tubman, it might be shown in schools. It might, it might be shown in schools. Don't tell me that this won't be put in some high school or something like that. And they're going to put this in front of all those kids talking about this is the story of Harriet Tubman. And we need to see it because we need to learn about Harriet Tubman. Don't tell me that's not going to happen because when I was in school, when I was in school two decades ago, I was watching films that were out at that time period that happened to be about historical characters, even though they weren't historical stories. They still put it in there because I need to see it. I need to see it for myself and see the amazingness of people. So guess what? Those kids going to school today, I mean, going to school next year, who are going to be freaking 16 years old, they're going to watch this film. It's going to be mandatory in their school. And that's what they're going to see. They're going to see Bigger Long hunting her down. They're going to say, oh, Bigger Long, man, he's going he gonna to get him. He's going to get him. So let's continue this bad boy, man. I don't want to get caught up on this ridiculously negative um, example of what curation is in Hollywood. Let's go a little further. How about band images? Oh, this one, everybody knows who this is. If you if you black, you know what this is right here. What happened here? What happened to this film? This is an image that everybody wanted to see. It was a slave film. Why was there a problem with this slave film? I don't understand. I mean, it's about slavery. It's about it's about this time period. I don't want to forget my history. So so what's the problem? You know what the problem is? The problem is Hollywood didn't get a chance to block this thing pre-production, right? Usually they kill it pre-production, but it was very popular. It was very popular at the Sundance Film Festival. So instead of killing it at pre-production, they went into the media and killed it post-production. They made it post-production. How'd they do it? They talked about something from freaking 30 years ago, something that he was accused of, that he won in court, that he won in court. So I guess the law doesn't matter, right? But then he gets gobbled up by the Me Too movement and they kill his freaking film on arrival. They couldn't kill it in pre-production. It was funded. It was popular. It was going to blow up no matter what. So they had to kill it in post-production. And they said, never again. Any film that you're going out there and you're rebelling, we are going to kill it no matter what. The bankers. The bankers got killed, too. They just recently released it on Apple, but the momentum it had for release was killed on arrival because of some random thing that happened with some character in the story from like 40, 50 years ago. And they said, hey, well, that person might not have been such a great person. So I guess we'll kill the entire production. This is the kind of thing they do. Whenever they have a story about super empowering black figures who are not going to take crap anymore and they're going to rebel and they're going to straight up even die if they have to in order to succeed, 
those are the voices they silence and they silence them usually in pre-production by never giving them a chance to even get it funded and if they can't do it then post-production they're going after them and they're trying to make sure that they tank the hell out of the of the launch of those things but maybe i'm wrong maybe you guys can explain to me what i'm wrong about on this one maybe i'm just making this all up am i wrong please let me know in the comments let me know if i'm wrong and if i'm right hit that like button you hit that like button and you share right now and tell those people uh, he's right about this. Why was this the only slave movie where we had a huge outrage over the director? We have entire film slates by known pedophiles, and, and, and they got all their films out, and nobody ever banned them. But somehow this guy who got accused 30 years ago and was innocent, he was, he was deemed innocent by the court. He got his movies tanked because of that. Ooh, look at this. I like this statement right here. Kobe, the day he died, they tried to destroy his legacy. They love it. They love it. They can't, They don't want nothing positive to, to, to connect to, you know, just, just black power, man. This is, that's why we got to protect black power. Men, women, right? Strong women, we need to protect that too. We need all that stuff. But we can't let the media decide what's good and what's not, right? The product is what's good and what's not. Don't let the media tell you this person's a bad guy, a bad hombre, right? Oh, that's a bad hombre, right? There's good people on both sides, that kind of crap. Don't let the media tell you what the hell is right and what's wrong. You should be able to decide that by yourself. This film right here was hot fire. And if it wasn't tanked by the media, it probably would have did a couple hundred million dollars. But it didn't because the media played hitman all right i'm not wrong i'm not wrong here you go and i love eddie griffin too i love eddie griffin if anybody in this crowd know eddie griffin tell him to holler at me because i love that dude man that dude is smart as hell he's a smart dude he said, but he said this. He did say this. He said, Hollywood wants every black man to have an asterisk in his name. He wants something negative to affiliate with the black celebrity to make sure that every single one has something negative to them. Right. And that's why I got such a big problem with slave movies, because so long as the slaves are very docile and, and waiting for someone to save them. It's a great film, noble controversy. Let it release. Let's put a lot of money into it. Let's make sure every black American sees it. When it's a story about rebellion, oh, look at all the horrible things this person did in their past. Look at all the look at all the horrible things this one um, um, cameraman, the cameraman, the third cameraman, the third cameraman did something bad last week. He he drunk and drove. This whole production is a sham. It's like this is the kind of thing they just they just take they just take stuff out of context to kill it. It's kind of crazy, man. Let's see. How about another one? I'm gonna give you another one. This one gotta rate. This one gotta get you angry right here. This man was a mythical character, an African god, right? Talking to African slaves to come into America, and his message was, "Burn the boat down." And they said but we can't swim. How will we live? And, and he said, you already dead anyway. At least kill these people too. And, and guess what the new director said when he came to the show? He fired my man, Mr. Nancy, fired one of the best characters in the whole show. He fired him. And he fired him for this very quote from him directly. This is the wrong message for black America. Who the fuck are you to tell me what is the wrong message for black America? Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm totally wrong for saying that. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe I should be curating what I think and what I hear based on some freaking director from Malibu, right? 
about some character that doesn't even exist. It's a mythology. <laughs> and they still said the idea of black people fighting to the death is toxic for black America. <laughs> I, I can't make this stuff up. I can't make this stuff up. I really can't. It's just, it's just, it's just too much. I, I just can't make this stuff up. And if you're wondering what this is, it's God. He said, um, what's it called? American Gods. American Gods. Watch season one and season two of American Gods. And don't even look, blink an eyelash at season three because Mr. Nancy's gone. But damn it, he said things that were so damn powerful in there. He was a straight up Malcolm X fire spitting Khalid Muhammad sounding dude. He was pissed and he was pissed all day and all night as was written in the story. And they said, well, I know it's in the story and I know he's probably the most popular character in the show, but I just don't think it's the right message for Amer for black America. So let's just get rid of him. Replace him with somebody who thinks all lives matter. <laughs> I can't do it, man. I can't do it. But that's what they say. They said we got to replace him with somebody who says all lives matter. All lives. Yes, they certainly do. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you guys, this is not a game. I laugh because it just irritates me so much. I don't want to I don't want to go too overboard, but I can't help but laugh sometimes when I see when I see stuff like this. When I see stuff like this and they're so bold. They're so bold with their decision making. They ain't say we're firing you because we don't have the money or we're firing you because because uh, uh, be, because uh, the script changing and your character has to die or something like that. I don't know. But they say we're firing you because we think that this is the wrong message for black America. According to me, a non black American. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, this is no game. You know why you know why I have right now 680 people being subscribers to my Patreon account and why I have 1,500 investors from the black community supporting our company as we make these animations and films and everything else about um, the ancient world? The reason why is because of this. They see it every day. They see it every day. They see the world tries to tell you what's appropriate you can't have a history. You can't even have pride. God forbid you have pride, so much pride, that if someone tried to take your freedom away, you would die for it. And when you say, oh, I'll die for it, and I'll kill everybody who tries to take it, they instantly say, well, that's not appropriate for black, for, 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 for black America. Let me remind you, the same people thought it was appropriate for Joker to basically kill off society because he was being picked on all his life. Joker was being picked on. He was he was getting picked on. So he is he is totally 100% justified to kill everyone that made him sad. But that's 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 appropriate for a movie. What's not appropriate for a movie is slaves openly rebelling against their masters and killing them to the point where they won't even survive themselves, yet they don't care. That's just too much of an idea. I mean, slavery is way, way better than being picked on. Being picked on is horrible. <laughs> telling you, man, I'm telling you. I'm, I'm going to go move past this slide. This slide kills me, so I'm going to move past it because this one right here bothers me. It bothers me a lot. To know this man lost his job and he was literally the best character in the entire series. So, you know, this is my call to action. I am done with this lecture for today, but this is my call to action for you guys. You know, first of all, like and subscribe on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. All right. If you don't follow me on Instagram, you're missing out because I'm kind of funny over there. I make a lot of jokes, right? I make a lot of political statements. I probably get in trouble sometimes, whatever, right? But it's fun. Um, always share this stuff with your friends, especially this one, because this one was a lecture, right? This is something about us talking about Hollywood as a whole, specifically as it relates to messaging about slavery, right? Slave movies, the time when we were in chains, what's acceptable, what's acceptable 
for us to understand about slavery and what we are not allowed to accept. We can't accept that some people straight up rebelled and just straight up killed anyone they could in order to get revenge. They don't like revenge stories. They think revenge stories is bad for black America. Mr. Nancy in God's in American Gods was 100% a revenge character. He didn't care about the war between gods and men. The only thing he cared about was getting his people out of this system. That's all he cared about. He was like, I, everybody else is fighting for who should be the right God and who shouldn't. But my followers are being slaughtered every day in America. He said, oh, that was too much for black America. He said, hey, hey, hey. He said, he ain't like that. So we got to protect that, right? Next thing, subscribe to Patreon. If you like this stuff, you like how I talk, if you like the content that we put out, especially for your kids, if you got children, you owe it to your children to be a part of our community. You just do because we make content for kids, right? Our kids, our content is appropriate for kids, but at the same time, it doesn't hide any punches and it doesn't have any agendas to cover to it. We make content that kids can be proud of and eventually they feel like they have a legacy behind them that's not about, well, my great, great, great grandfather was a slave and my great, great grandfather was a was a person in civil rights hoping that he wouldn't be lynched and now I'm me, right? It's like this, that's a bad legacy. It just is. I don't care what anyone says. You should know your history, but damn it, that is not the legacy. When white people grow up in life, they say, they look at Rome. They say, look at how great Rome was. This is my legacy. This is where my people come from. How foolish of me if I can't succeed in life because look how great the Romans were. Look how great Julius Caesar was. He was nobody and then he became the greatest. There's a reason. There's a reason why they teach it, right? And we need to be able to teach our kids the same stuff. Lastly, become a stockholder. Come on, baby. This is easy. We got, we got a fund in August. We're going to be raising more capital. You can buy your stock then. And I know... A lot of you already did buy your stock. Trust me, we lit and we actually do things correctly with business and stuff like that. Our books are on the table. So people ain't got no questions about what we're doing, how we're doing it and whatever. All right. Now, I want to take some questions from the community. Feel free to shoot those questions there in the comment section. I'm going to pull them up and I'm going to try to go back and forth with you guys. All right. I'm going to do this for about five minutes and then we're out. Ah, here we go. So one question of, um, from Alexander says, how do you become a stakeholder? Well, it's very simple. Um, in about in August, we're going to do an uh, investment round through WeFunder.com. That's usually where we do our investment rounds. Uh, just buy some stock then. Hopefully, you'll get in before it uh, closes. Most of the people who are going to be buying stock early are going to be people from in, um, Patreon and people who are already investors. There's a lot of people who are already investors in our company who say they're going to buy stock again. So hopefully it won't get too greedy and there'll be some left over for the public. But if you don't want to take your chances, become a patron because I always let my people know first before anybody else does. Give them about 72 hours to go and do what they got to do before I open the gates to the next wave. You know what I'm saying? How do I get the Black Sands movie? Well, we currently have a DVD on our store. That's episode one, two, and three, plus an animated pilot and our um, music album as well. So you can buy that for like 20 bucks on our store. Um, there's other things as well that you can go and look for. Um, and we're making episode four, five, and six now, thanks to the patrons. We hit 600 uh, patrons. So now we're capable of, um, of actually funding the next three episodes. Uh, so that's going to be pretty dope. Um, here's the information below in case you guys need it and you want to sign up today. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so um, the question about this particular video. Will this video be available on your channel after it ends? Not immediately. So what happens is YouTube takes a video down. It processes everything, saves all the comments and everything else in real time, and then it re-uploads it. So eventually tomorrow or something, you're going to see this video back up, right? But right after I hit the, the end video, 
most likely it's going to be down for a couple of hours or whatever while it's processing and everything else. All right. All right. So when does the close date for this investment round? And the answer is there is no close date. When we hit maximum, we're done. Last time it took us three weeks to hit maximum. Three weeks. So we went very fast to raise that half a million dollars. So I expect this campaign to go even faster because people are prepared now. And a lot of people missed the first time. We had 400 people get refunded because they invested after we hit 480K. Legally, I can't close a round out until six days after I've hit max. So you get six extra days after that, but there's no guarantee you're going to get in because you were already past the maximum allowed amount for investment, right? So, so that's the answer. Maybe two, three weeks to raise the money. So please get in early and save your money. Don't don't wait. Don't wait for that next check. It might it might not make it. Here's a good one. I like this point right here. Hey, how many of you guys have heard over and over again on Instagram, on Facebook, on Google, you hear the same thing? Oh, man, this celebrity is trying to make this film. Oh, man, this guy's going to make a story about the Moors. Oh, man, this guy's going to make something about the Haitian Revolution. And, and how many decades have we heard that, but we never actually see the film created? There's a reason for that. They don't, they don't fund them. They never fund those stories. They don't want those stories. Yep. Yep. And the reason why Danny Glover never did was simply because Hollywood would not fund it. And he just didn't have the infrastructure in place to fund it himself. What I'm doing, and I seem to be very, very good at doing, is galvanizing black community in order to invest in properties to build. So what happens is we're doing these investment rounds, and then we're going to fund the entire show of Black Sands independently. That's millions of dollars. That's tens of millions of dollars. And we're still going to do it. I know I'm capable of doing it. And we're going to do it directly through you guys. So you guys have the power over what's made and what's not made. I think it's possible. Danny Glover, he wasn't that kind of thinker. when he, you know, he was looking for someone in Hollywood to fund his film, right? And they just wouldn't. And that's the reality of Hollywood. 40 years, and they haven't funded one yet. People keep telling me I shouldn't talk like that about Disney. I shouldn't talk like that about Marvel because they'll magically give me the deal. But nobody's got the deal in 40 years. What do you think? That's an accident? That ain't no accident. So we got to do it ourselves, and we will do it ourselves. <laughs> you know, Imani, Imani, you're so cruel, man. No, first of, first of all, don't do that to everybody. You can't be scaring people like that, all right? That's my job. My job is to scare the hell out of people, all right? I'm supposed to go within the first 24 hours. I say, well, 200,000 of my 500,000 is gone in 24 hours. Oh, well, I hope you guys can make it. That's my job. Why are you trying to scare people like that? You can't be doing stuff like that, all right? <laughs> Look at this quote. He said, he said, I'm an investor, and I'm telling y'all, we're going to buy it all. There ain't going to be nothing but crumbs left. Well, damn, that's kind of rude, but I can't stop people from doing what they got to do. They're trying to build for their families, too. Hey, Jordan, thank you so much for those words, man. I just want to say um, thank you, too, for just tuning in, right? Thank you so much. I, I'm going to tell you right now, nothing does more for me and my channel. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Nothing does more. If you want to help us, even being a patron is nice. But you know what makes YouTube channels blow up? When you record a little snippet of what I'm saying, right? You record it with your phone or whatever. And then you tag me on Instagram. 
and say, man, that dude is spitting on YouTube. You got to watch this because all your friends and stuff are now exposed to my programming and my content. And then they start checking us out. And then the algorithm says, man, this guy really reaches out to new people. Let's go and push it out to others as well. That is very important. So if you want to help me out, right, if you guys want to help me out in any way, that you'd be surprised how effective that is to just straight up say your own statement, say, man, this dude is wilding out right here. You know he's speaking truth, baby. And, and that stuff gets it. It gets it a lot, man. So all I'm saying is if you want to tag me on Instagram, I would love it. <laughs> Uh, here's an interesting question. Uh, what's your take on Black Panther or working with other Black visionaries? I've signed a lot of Black people, so I have a lot of I have a lot of Black and Brown creators who are making comic books themselves. They made their own books. They don't have nearly the market I have, but they have their own books, and we've signed them exclusively to Black Sands Publishing, which is our app that we're developing. The app will come out in November. The website to apply to become featured on the app might come out in late August. That's when anybody can apply, bring the comic books, put it in there, webtoons, web comics, and we're going to try to get as many people on there as possible. So, yes, we are working with black creatives all over the place, and we're going to give them a platform where they can finally reach their audience instead of having to dig through all the crap that's webtoons, right? You ain't never seen no black people on webtoons, and every single one that you see you know, is made by somebody who's not black. So we got to give an audience to us. We got to make an audience specifically for us so we can enjoy um, black creative content and actually get money in the hands of black creators. I pay people. I don't sign them and be like, I signed you and you. I own your content and I didn't give you jack. I pay people. Remember, so last thing, uh, remember, patreon.com slash black sands. I'm going to give you the link right now. Patreon.com slash black sands. Uh, you can go there and you can subscribe to us. You can do five or 20. It doesn't really matter. I guarantee you if you do the five, you'll still be able to get into the investment round, even though the $20 tier is for the first day. Don't worry about that. I doubt the entire campaign will close in three days. I hope I doubt. Because I know I'm going to make it no matter what, but I don't want it to go so fast that people never got a chance. That would be very, you know, I don't want to hype a whole bunch of people up and then find out that everybody bought it up within the first two days and got and nobody else got a chance to. That would be kind of, that'd be kind of messed up, right? But, <laughs> but hopefully you guys will get it, you know, at the $5 tier as well. And basically anybody who's subscribing is helping me out immensely. And you get 11 comic books, 11 comic books on day one. Come on, man. 11 comic books, day one, two more comic books coming out at the end of the month. <laughs> That's crazy. All right. So I'll holler at you guys later on. Thank you so much for coming out to our first lecture. Let me know how you rate this out of 10 in the comments section. And I'm out. <laughs>